All right, well, now we're going to talk about the Great Plains. And first, we need to define our terms. So, when we're talking about the Great Plains, the region that we're talking about is specifically this part right here, uh, going right down through the middle of the United States, down uh, to the, uh, the Texas-Mexico border, and extending beyond the Canadian border a good ways up into Canada generally divided into uh, the northern plains and the southern plains. Now the, the plains uh, is an area where there is uh, there's a lot of grassland. Um, it is drier than the regions to the east of it and the, the different uh, well the different kinds of grasses kind of help to define different parts of the region like the uh, the tall grass region which you can see a, a picture of the tall grass there in the upper right and then that's the uh, the dark green on the map that actually uh, covers part of uh, what we would call the Midwest including uh, most of Illinois and all of Iowa and good part of uh, Missouri part of Minnesota um, the eastern parts of uh, Kansas and Oklahoma, a little swath into uh, central Texas, and all of Nebraska, the tall grass region. The, uh, the opposite of that is the short grass region, also known as the steppe, the short grass steppe, also also known as the high plains. And that is the area that sort of Manila colored there. It's this. Well, it's a small area compared to uh, uh, some of the others. Uh, it is uh, part of North Texas, little bit uh, of uh, of Western um, New Mexico and and Colorado and and parts of of Kansas. So the uh, the high plains. Now there are uh, two other regions, one in the north and one in the south, where there's tall grass and short grass sort of mixed together. And so you can see on the map where those are. Now, I'm a, I'm a pop culture sort of guy. And I also, uh, in my lifetime, have and continue to watch a lot of westerns. And so I visualize things uh, relative to western things I've seen so I kind of since I'm not from the Great Plains um, I sort of visualize the difference between these grasses uh, with these two images if you've ever seen Little House on the Prairie which is set in Minnesota which is part of the tall grass area uh, you'll remember the, the the show comes on and the little girls are running down this hill in this very tall grass now um, High Plains Drifter is set in North Texas, right there in the High Plains. I think it was North Texas, the the fictional city of Lago, and that's the uh, the short grass steppe, very different uh, and significantly drier than Minnesota. So as that movie's coming on, Clint Eastwood comes mysteriously appearing out of a cloud of dust, and it looks like it's almost a desert. So. Those are the two extremes. Here is another map that uh, uh, classifies it uh, tall grass and mid grass and short grass. And here's a good map that shows the moisture level in these various regions. Actually, this shows the moisture level, the rainfall level of the entire country. So it sort of ranges from blue as being a whole lot of rain and that's essentially uh, only in uh, the coast in the Pacific Northwest up there in Seattle and, and Oregon uh, and almost down into Northern California and then kind of a dark green that's a fairly good amount of rain and then the really light green that's less rain and as you're traveling if you go over east of the Mississippi it's, it's all green pretty much but as you travel westward uh, the green gets lighter because the rain decreases uh, until you reach a point there in the high plains. Um, well, actually, uh, 
just before this it's more in the uh, uh, the mid grass level there where it's uh, uh, quite a bit drier and then as that sort of orange color gets darker and turns to red uh, that is very very little rain at all uh, so the high plains are actually there where it starts being orange orangish where it says hotter longer growing seasons and that's a that's a difference between north and south uh, rainfall is similar but the uh, temperature is different so in the northern plains um, it's a little bit uh, well it's 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 cooler uh, there's a shorter growing season and in the south it's hotter and there's a longer growing season all right um, here just for the fun of it is uh, a map of all the major rivers in the Great Plains region um, the Missouri uh, and the uh, the Arkansas and the Platte being some of the largest rivers branching off from the Mississippi now another thing that stands out about the uh, plains is that rivers there tend to be much shallower than rivers east of the Mississippi which means there's less water in them which also means uh, it's harder to travel by steamboat on on those rivers because you need you know you need some water really all right well here's another look at that first map showing us where the region is and this is uh, uh, some additions that I made this myself to show which tribes uh, were located in the Great Plains in 1492 when Christopher Columbus showed up in the Caribbean. Columbus came nowhere close to this area, but it's just a point of reference, okay? So, uh, not many tribes living on the plains. And then I've got several other tribes, all of which were not living on the plains in 1492, but by 1800 would be. But initially, you've got the... Uh, uh, in the northern plains, Hidatsa, Mandan, and Arikara. You've got the Pawnee, fairly big tribe there in uh, Nebraska. Uh, and then you've got the, uh, the the Wichita right on the edge. And uh, down there in Texas, you've got the Tonkawa and the Tejas. Uh, but uh, the significant thing about all these tribes living at that time in the plains, they were all agricultural tribes. They were not tribes that lived by hunting the buffalo. They, uh, they built their villages, permanent, permanent or semi-permanent villages, along river banks. Uh, so there was, uh, well, there was more moisture, for one thing. Uh, why did they not make their living by hunting buffalo? Because Indians didn't have horses at this time. And uh, it becomes kind of challenging, you know, to catch and overpower buffalo on foot uh, and it becomes even more challenging to get from place to place with your your buffalo right so uh, there was some buffalo hunting and had been for many many thousands of years really before this uh, on the plains usually done by uh, uh, chasing the buffalo off the edge of a cliff that was one of the favorite ways to do it but uh, none of the tribes made a living at that because that's just kind of like a big bonus when you can get it they made their living by farming. Now, over the next two or three centuries, there were a lot of tribes that moved into the area, joining those agricultural tribes uh, for various different reasons. The, uh, the Sioux and the Ojibwe and the Cheyenne all had originally been in the Great Lakes region and were driven westward by the expanding Iroquois during the Beaver Wars. The uh, the Comanche kind of uh, drifted uh, southward from the uh, Shoshone group where they had originally been uh, and chased the Apaches that had been living in the southern plains off the southern plains and, and down into the desert southwest. And then you'll see, you'll see several, uh, several groups there originating in Illinois and going directly westward onto the plains uh, into into Iowa and Missouri and then into Kansas and, and Nebraska. Those were agricultural tribes, the, the Ponca, Iowa or Iowa, Omaha, and etc. But the, uh, uh, the, the Sioux and the Cheyenne and the, uh, 
the Arapaho who made their way down, who had originally uh, been closer to the Canadian border, the Comanches. All those are nomadic tribes that uh, follow the buffalo herds because by now they've got horses. That's why they were able to do that. So here is um, a, an image representing the, uh, the tribes who were in the area by 1800 when uh, you know the Louisiana Purchase was made and Americans like not Native Americans, but uh, United States Americans started coming into the area. Uh, so you'll see there's quite a few there by that time. Um, the Teton Sioux, also known as the Lakota, um, dominated the north, the northern plains in the 19th century, and the Comanches dominated the southern plains in the 19th century. So uh, that's the Native people who were there as the uh, the settlers started coming in. Now, so far as the settlers coming in, that's been part of the great American narrative, hasn't it? That's been part of the story of uh, American progress and the fair-haired maiden of the West. The conquering of the West is how it's often been presented. Uh, William Cronin, the, uh, the esteemed environmental historian, has uh, said that there are two separate narratives that have been told about the uh, movement of uh, U.S. citizens out onto the plains. One is a narrative of progress, and the other a narrative of declension. Uh, so two completely different ways of looking at it. The narrative of progress sees the Great Plains as, and people called it this back then, the Great American Desert. Uh, which was going to be transformed into a garden. The Great Plains turned into a garden by the settlers. How? By, by their... Uh, by their ingenuity and indomitable force of will, by gaining mastery and control over nature, over the region. So this, this narrative, the uh, narrative of progress, is essentially the, the same narrative that we've been talking about since the beginning of this course in Western culture, right? The, the second narrative, the narrative of declension, is the opposite of that. Essentially, this argues the Great Plains was already essentially a garden or a paradise, uh, and when the settlers came in, they destroyed it and turned it into a desert. Now, as we will see later, this argument was already being made as it was happening in the late 19th century. All right, well, when it comes to discussions about the Great Plains by historians in the late 19th, early 20th century, there are two individuals to look at. First, uh, your friend and mine, Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, who keeps turning up in all of my classes except History of Japan, uh, uh, because he did something uh, very remarkable, which is that he delivered a paper at a conference and anyone at all paid attention. Uh, his, his work, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, in 1893. Now, uh, one of the things about that work that I often uh, point to uh, as being one of the most important parts of it was his argument that American identity was formed on the, the idea that you can continue improving yourself by continuing to go further west into the interior of the country and that you will have uh, opportunity to get, to get land and... Uh, to further progress in civilization, uh, if you were, uh, if you will, and that by the 1890s there was no more west to go to. But uh, another important aspect of his uh, of his work is that he essentially said that there were uh, a series. There was a series of different frontiers: the fur traders first, then the ranchers move in, then the miners finally. 
the farmers. And after the farmers move in, well, then soon afterward, you've got the development of, uh, of towns. So the progress of civilization. Now, some more uh, modern Western historians, uh, the uh, historians of the New West, uh, have taken, uh, well, they have uh, they've deconstructed a lot of what, uh, what uh, Turner said uh, and uh, several valid complaints, including the fact that he completely leaves out everyone except the white men in this whole thing. Uh, but uh, still an important work to be aware of. The, uh, the second one uh, was a book that came out in 1931 called The Great Plains by Walter Prescott Webb, one of the, uh, one of the great early Western historians of the 20th century. He also wrote a really, really good book about the history of the Texas Rangers that was called Texas Rangers um, that has, uh, well, uh, a lot of uh, the important narrative about that organization in it. Although, again... Like uh, like Frederick Jackson Turner skips over a lot of a uh, lot of relevant stuff. Anyway, Webb uh, talked about um, the ranchers and the farmers and their challenges in the Great Plains. Three environmental challenges: the fact that it was so dry, the fact that there were so few trees. In fact, you get to the high plains. Uh, and you will only find trees near uh, bodies of water, which are also not that uh, easy to find. Uh, and, as I mentioned earlier, when you do find uh, rivers, they're very shallow. So those are three challenges, which were overcome according to Webb. And again, this is part of that progressive uh, narrative, just like uh, Frederick Jackson Turner was part of the progressive narrative. You know, that uh, things just keep on... Uh, getting better as civilization, quote-unquote, progresses. Um, technology. Technology is what overcame those environmental challenges. Um, technology like the six-gun, the revolver, introduced in the 1840s by the Colt Company, because you can kill a bunch of Indians at once, basically. That's what he was arguing. And that helped to clear out the native people. Uh, barbed wire windmills, the steel plow invented by John Deere that we've talked about before, uh, and the mechanical harvester invented by Cyrus McCormick, and the coming of the railroad into the West. We talked about the railroad quite a bit when we were discussing the uh, market revolution, and that was uh, the impact of the railroad in the U.S. during the Industrial Revolution era, particularly by the 1840s. But we're talking now post-Civil War, after the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, right after the end of that war, that opened things up significantly in ways that you would expect, you know, like uh, uh, the fact that now uh, farmers' goods could be delivered to even more distant markets, uh, this uh, increase in uh, transportational ability kind of drew people closer together, not emotionally, uh, but uh, also led to the development of Chicago as the meatpacking capital, um, and other things that, uh, that you might not have ever associated with the railroad, uh, including the age of the cowboy, the cattle drive. Now, uh, I can no longer assume that all my students have seen Western movies, uh, unlike, you know, when I was a kid, when, uh, uh, when everyone watched them. Um, but I hope at least some of you have, or, or are at least familiar with the uh, tropes of, uh, of the Western, the cattle drive being a big part of it, right? The cowboys gathering up the cattle and, and, and driving them. Uh, well, where are they driving them to is the question. They're driving them to the railroad. Um, this era opened up when the Transcontinental Railroad came through the American West, through the Great Plains uh, and other parts of the West. Now, there had been a cattle business before. Uh, there had been, of course, uh, 
Mexican cattle business all along the border from California to Texas. Uh, that was primarily about hides and tallow rather than shipping meat because it was hard to ship the meat a great distance without trains. Uh, and there was some cattle business in Louisiana and East Texas before the Civil War. Uh, but uh, if you were going to take those cattle to uh, uh, a market, to a significant market, usually what happened is that uh, uh, cattle uh, drovers on foot, mostly, walked those cattle up uh, into uh, Louisiana or over to Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, but once the railroad came through, everything changed. So this map shows us the primary railroads running through the West by around 1870. So uh, you can just barely see uh, Chicago up there in the upper right um, with these, uh, these railroad lines passing through there. All roads lead to Chicago, all railroads. Uh, so you've got in the north going uh, through Iowa, Nebraska, and into Wyoming, the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, that's the one that uh, met up with the Central Pacific, eventually in Utah, to finish the Transcontinental Railroad. But you've also got these two different railroad lines uh, that diverge there in eastern Kansas with the Kansas Pacific Railroad to the north and the Santa Fe, uh, which is actually, uh, the full name is the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad, passing through central and southern Kansas. So those are the railroads. Now all of a sudden, if you own cattle in Texas, there is a way for you to get your to get your cattle to a a much larger market than you had had available to you before. So uh, what would happen is that well at this time the ranchers. Uh, they didn't have fences. Uh, they just had open range, and they let their cattle just kind of wander around out there. And in the springtime, uh, there was a roundup. So the cowboys who worked for a particular ranch, they would come through. They would find all the calves that had been born since last year. Um, and they would then be brought in for branding so that the... Uh, you know, this, the, the brand of that particular ranch would be put onto the cattle so everyone knows that's who it belongs to. By the way, there was a guy in, uh, in Texas who became infamous for getting out there, him and his, uh, his cowboys, uh, getting out there and grabbing up other people's unbranded calves before they could get to them um, and then putting his brand on them, you know, because they had no brand. They were unclaimed, technically, he said. His name was John Maverick. And that's where the expression uh, maverick for not being owned by anybody uh, came from. Anyway, they would gather the calves. They'd gather all the cattle that were running around loose. Um, and then they would, uh, that's when they would have the cattle drive, which they would have, uh, depending on how many cattle, usually several hundred. Uh, and you would have maybe a dozen, two dozen cowboys uh, who would then drive that herd, and by drive I mean basically push them, not not physically getting off their horses and pushing them, but herding them northward, northward toward Kansas, where the railroads were. So they had to go up uh, through uh, through Texas and through Indian Territory, um, which uh, the eastern part of Indian Territory was the five civilized tribes, Cherokees and so forth. But the western trail, you'll see over there, uh, that goes through western part of Indian Territory, that's where the Comanches were, uh, go, through, uh, go through Indian Territory and up into Kansas to one of these towns that had sprung up along the railroad line. Uh, these tiny little towns that either had not existed at all or had just been little hamlets all of a sudden become booming, booming towns because... All of these cattle herds start coming up from Texas with all these cowboys uh, and coming to the railroad, uh, uh, to, to, to the stock pens near the railroad station in towns like Abilene and Dodge City. Well, 
it would take about two or three months to make this trip for the herd. Uh, they travel very slowly. You don't want to make your cattle trot all the way from, uh, from San Antonio up to Dodge City. Because if you do, um, if you make them go too fast, they'll lose weight. And you'll lose money, right? Uh, so you, you take a little bit of a leisurely trip because uh, you want them to keep their weight on. Get them up there to the stockyards. And then the uh, uh, the the foreman uh, of the of the outfit would uh, uh, would negotiate. Usually, he'd have a buyer already lined up, maybe, or he'd negotiate with cattle buyers who would pay for those living cattle that would then be uh, after they were bought, loaded onto stock cars on trains with uh, uh, cattle prods pushing them in. Uh, cow pokes, uh, if you will, uh, and then uh, shipped to Chicago, uh, where they would be slaughtered and turned into steaks uh, to, to sell and, and other things around the country. So that's how the cattle drive business worked. There was uh, one, one drive called the uh, Goodnight Loving Trail, which is not as romantic as it sounds. That was the names of the two guys. Charles Goodnight and Oliver Loving, who led their herd up to, all the way up to Wyoming, to Cheyenne, Wyoming, to meet up with the Union Pacific Railroad up there. Uh, by the way, if you're familiar with Lonesome Dove, uh, that cattle drive is loosely based on the Goodnight Loving Trail. Well, um, this is... This is the lifestyle that has been romanticized in Western fiction, uh, Western uh, uh, movies, television shows for 150 years since then. How long did this period last? How long was there free-range cattle in large numbers that were taken northward on cattle drives up into Kansas or up to Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, how long did that go on? Not that long. Uh, about 20 years is all for reasons that we're about to go into, which, which is kind of, uh, kind of odd, maybe not what you would expect, because so much has been made of this era and so much romanticizing has been done of this era. It feels as though, kind of like the antebellum cotton south uh, that seems like it must have been generations and generations was really only a short time few decades uh, lifetime of one person this was even shorter a part of the reason was because they kept building more railroads you know um, it was only going to be so long that there were just a couple of railroads in the american west uh, there were spurs built so that you know if you had a ranch in texas all, you only had to make it to Texas uh, to, to get to a railroad. Uh, so that was one aspect of, of what caused things to change. Another one was environmental. The big die-up, it was called. A huge blizzard. Actually, it was two really bad winters in a row. The winter of 1886-87... And then the following winter of 87, 88 wasn't much better. That changed everything. Now, here's, the, uh, here's part of the problem that ranchers faced. Um, a lot of these areas uh, where there were cattle ranches that had been built in places like Kansas and Colorado and uh, Nebraska and uh, Wyoming, um, the settlers who had moved into those areas, including the ranches, thought they knew what the weather, weather patterns were because they would notice year by year about how cold it got, and that seemed to be the norm. The problem is that in the, in the Great Plains, on the average, roughly about once every 20 years, there's a catastrophic blizzard. And none of those settlers had lived there for 20 years yet. 20 years before this, uh, the railroads hadn't uh, come through and these areas hadn't really been opened up. 
They could have asked the Indians uh, if they hadn't, you know, been busy shooting back and forth at them. Uh, but no one did. Uh, or they could have asked maybe some of the fur traders uh, who had uh, been in the area first. But they, it was just assumed, okay, here's about how cold it gets. And so this open range system where you just turn your cattle loose, let them roam, and then in the springtime go out and find them, um, that's all well and good until a huge blizzard hits. Or in this case, an entire winter that's one big, long, huge blizzard. So how are you going to take care of your cattle if there's a blizzard and you have no idea where they are? See, that's the problem. There were, there, there, there were, were no fences. There were no fences. Um, barbed wire was just starting to be used around this time. Really picked up after this. Uh, so lots of, uh, lots of uh, ranches went out of business, especially the smaller ones, because their losses were catastrophic because so many of their cattle died. Some of them died by freezing to death. Some of them died of suffocation because the, uh, the sleet was, uh, was blowing, the wind was blowing so hard that the sleet and the snow and the ice was coming in horizontally and jammed up in the cattle's nostrils uh, and froze uh, and suffocated them that way. Uh, some of them starved to death because it was so cold the ground was a sheet of ice and they couldn't uh, break through to get to any, uh, any grass underneath that. They also lost some cowboys, actually. Uh, people died, uh, sometimes just trying to make it out to the barn or out to the outhouse because it was so, so rough. And in fact, it was not uncommon for people to, when going uh, to the outhouse or out to the barn, to take some stakes not like steaks to eat, but wooden steaks uh, or metal steaks and rope uh, so that you could find your way back. Um, if any of you saw the movie The Hateful Eight by Quentin Tarantino a few years ago, uh, this is set during that winter, and you can get a good idea of just what that blizzard uh, was like. It was, uh, it was not uh, exaggerated in the film, though a lot of other stuff was. Anyway... When, the, uh, <clears throat> when the, the snow and ice melted, and there's all those dead cattle, and a lot of people out of business, a lot of people ruined financially. After that, the cattle ranchers who were still in business decided, you know what would be a good idea? Uh, fencing our pastures in so that we know where our cattle are. Uh, and so they started doing that more often. So... Uh, due to that happening, that ended the free-range uh, thing, and more railroads being built eliminated the need for cattle drives, and that romanticized cattle drive era was, was over almost as quickly as it had begun. Well, um, as <clears throat> Frederick Jackson Turner, uh, as, as, well as, uh, as well as Webb, had said when the ranchers uh, start to go down, the next wave is the farmers. And uh, in this particular case, that certainly is how it worked out uh, because more settlers were coming in uh, around the time that the ranchers were starting to, to, to lose some power and go out of business. And particularly, uh, we'll talk about this later because we're actually going to have a whole section where we talk about uh, government land policy. Um, a lot of settlers uh, come through because there are more opportunities to get access to government-owned public land. But when that happens, it uh, uh, leads to conflict with the ranchers. Now, this also is a common trope in Western stories, novels and movies. Um, and... Uh, it also is based in fact. There were cattle wars during this time. There was the uh, Johnson County War in Wyoming. There was the Lincoln County War in New Mexico that essentially were uh, almost full-scale war uh, 
between people working for ranchers and groups of small farmers coming in. Why, why was uh, there so much tension? Well, one thing is that the land that the uh, ranchers had come out onto was public land, government-owned land, right? They bought it from, uh, in this case, Napoleon. Um, the cattle ranchers just kind of used it, didn't necessarily have ownership. They didn't necessarily uh, pay anybody for it in some cases. They just claimed it. And now it is possible for small independent farmers to come in and make claims sponsored by the government in land that the cattle ranchers viewed as theirs. Now, for the for the cattle ranchers that they had been in this uh, this period, like I said, turning their cattle loose to roam, and that required a lot of land. Some of these ranches were huge, and another thing that it required was access to water for the cattle. So that's one of the biggest sources of conflict between the ranchers and the farmers. Who gets the water? Um, it's still a big source of conflict. Water is in the American West because of uh, because of how how arid that it is. All right, and, and I've got here um, one of the one of the classic Western stories, Shane, that was originally. Uh, a novel um, and then was uh, turned into a movie in the 1950s that really uh, has all the the basic tropes of, of a western. You've got the cattle baron and you've got the small farmers and you've got the gunfighter that comes through. Um, sod busters. Uh, sometimes I, I've, I'm, I surprise myself when I find that students aren't familiar with that term anymore. That's a term for farmer. Right, uh, sodbuster. It's an insulting term for a farmer. Sodbusters wear clodhoppers, uh, which are work shoes rather than cowboy boots that you can hop from clod to clod when you're busting your sod. Right. Anyway, um, this uh, didn't happen maybe as often as it's portrayed in the movies, but it did actually happen. Uh, and Shane, the reason uh, the reason I put this up here is. Uh, because, as I mentioned, it covers all the basic tropes of the Western film. But also, when I first started teaching this course and I was looking for movies to show or to recommend, environmental movies, I was initially surprised to find Shane uh, in every list, just about. Because it's all about control of the water. And in the Great Plains and the American West, in general, at least the the southern part, uh, control of water, like I said, is still a big issue. By the way, I wrote a trail drive novel that was fairly well received, and I think one of my better efforts, and I just couldn't resist mentioning that here under these circumstances. <laughs>